Good morning. Welcome to Discovery's Digital Gathering. We are glad you're here. We are excited for what God has in store this morning. We want to invite you to download our app, which will help you stay current with our community and get further connected by filling out our new visitor card. Let's prepare our hearts for worship and for the adventure of discovering the good news of Jesus together. Hello friends, my name is Steve and I'm the lead pastor here at Discovery and also your host for this morning's digital gathering. Let's get ready for worship together with this reading from Psalm 16. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. Nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The word of the Lord. Now raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies Now raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief Now raise a hallelujah
Thank you, James, for leading us in worship, and thank you all for uh, gathering with us today, even in this way. It's great to be together uh, online with you all. Uh, a couple of things that we want to invite you uh, into, um, thinking about ways to be connected and uh, plugged into the life of our church here at Discovery. One of the simplest things for you to do is to download our Discovery Christian Church app. One of the first things you click on there is the Connect card couple pieces of information and you will be in the flow of communication that we send out over the course of the weeks and months. Um, so that's one really simple step that you can take. Uh, once you have that app though, there's a lot of other avenues that open up to you. There's ways to sign up to serve, ways to share prayer requests, ways to chat with other folks um, in our community, and then also ways to keep up on the different events and, and things that are happening here at Discovery. So check that out if you have not done so. Yet, And then speaking of things going on here at Discovery, two things that we want to tell you about this morning. We're really excited to uh, begin to be able to open up in-person gatherings uh, in the theater to kids programming. We've been all together in the theater for the last couple of months, really all together for almost the last two years, whether that's been at home, in the digital space, whether that's been out in the park or even now in the theater. There's been a lot of sweetness to that, being able to worship as a family in that way but we're also excited for our kids to be able to get back together to build community to grow in friendship with one another and have that sort of set aside time just for them so we wanted to tell you a little bit more about that we will be sending an email out to families here in a couple of weeks but we're also going to have a, a, a brief time after the uh, in-person gathering on november 21st to just talk about where we're at what the plan is how that's going to work and to fill you in on some of those details. So if you're able to come to the in-person gathering at the theater on November 21st, stick around for a few minutes afterwards and we'll uh, fill you in and get you up to speed on some of the developments with children's ministry. It's really exciting, some of the stuff that's, that's coming together there right now. The other thing that I wanted to tell you about is this. You know, over the last couple of years, we've been developing our internship program. And COVID sort of threw a wrench into that and has slowed it down, but now we're to the point where we're ready to ramp that back up. And so if you are graduating, if you are um, discerning God's call on your life, particularly as it relates to leadership and, uh, and, and ministry, we would love to talk to you more about that. We're looking to uh, build a team, a cohort of interns who will serve with us, learn with us, grow with us, from September 2022 through the summer of 2023. So that may feel like it's a ways off, but as we plan and get ready for that, some things are gonna start happening fairly quickly and we want to see who's interested and who wants to be a part of that conversation. So again, uh, those of you who are thinking about or getting ready to graduate, who are thinking about ministry, who uh, would, would like to serve in, in a more intentional formational capacity, uh, let me know, send an email to steve at discoverydavis.org and we can start that conversation about interning next year. All right, we're going to pause here now for this moment in our digital gathering to take, a, take some time to reflect on how God has blessed us financially. Every week when we do this, we pause to uh, uh, consider God's generosity towards us and then to partner with Him by giving back to Him a portion of what He has blessed us with. Here at Discovery, we aim to give worshipfully, missionally, and sacrificially 
Uh, this is not just about a, a duty or checking a religious box or funding an organization. This is about partnering with God uh, and the work that he is doing here in and through Discovery, not just in Davis, but even around the world. Let's pray for this morning's offering. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for all that you are doing in us and through us individually, but also as a church. And for the great opportunity that we have to share our resources and for you to take that and to use that to build your kingdom, to build your church, to share the good news of Jesus, to meet uh, tangible needs. And for the opportunity, God, that it, it gives us to see you at work. So we pray this morning that you would take what we are able to give, that you would multiply it many times over, that you would use it to help people discover the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his powerful name. And everybody said, Amen. If you have a Bible, meet me this morning in Acts chapter 17. Acts is in the New Testament right after the four accounts of the life of Jesus. And this chapter is interesting because it actually comes where we left off in our conversation in Acts earlier this year, that conversation that we were calling Ecclesia. So today, part three of what we talk about when we talk about the gospel meets our conversation in the book of Acts, an intertwining of those two series. This is going to be fun. Now, we wrap up this conversation called what we talk about when we talk about the gospel. Definitely a mouthful. And then also sort of weird, right, to only spend three weeks on this because when it comes to the gospel, this is, I mean, we could keep talking about this forever and ever and ever. And we do. We do talk about it week in and week out. But for the sake of this uh, convo, what it means for our church, we decided to limit it to three weeks. And just as a quick review, part one, week one, was a look at the gospel, the good news that Jesus actually proclaimed. The announcement of this new kingdom, this reality, right, that is present here and now. Week one was about the kingdom. Part two, week two, was about the king. If there's a kingdom, then there is a king. We have a strong tendency in our fallen human state to go after other kings, to worship other kinds of kings. But Jesus is the king of this kingdom, reigning over all of us. And our response to this reality and to Jesus as king is a decision, a direction, and a dedication. So there's the reality of the kingdom, there's our response to the king, and now today we're going to keep going into this, into our participation in the good news, in the gospel. Too often, the gospel is, is, is a thing that is presented, and it's sort of like, do you agree or disagree with this thing. But the good news of Jesus is less about agree, disagree, and a lot more about participate or not participating. The story we looked at last week was this, this story about a young man, a rich young man, who has an encounter with Jesus. And after that encounter and conversation with Jesus, he leaves sad. And, and, and there's this big question, right, hanging over that story. What is this young man going to do? It's not a question of does he agree or disagree. It is a question of will he participate or will he not. The kingdom of God is a reality. It is a way of life that we participate in. The gospel is not an idea that we sign on to, intellectually agree with. It's something we practice. It's something we become. I want to pause here and invite you to pray with me before we get into Acts 17. Father, we pray now that you would take all that we bring into this moment as we uh, engage with this, watch this online, listen to this wherever we might be. Would you help us to sort of slow down for a moment? Would you remove the distractions? Would you hold all of the, the things we bring into this space? Would you hold it for us so that we can be fully present, tuned into your spirit, our, our ears our eyes available, uh, our hearts soften for whatever you want to say to us today. Would you give us also the courage, God, to respond in whatever ways we need to respond? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts 17, 
if you remember back to our, our earlier conversation about the book of Acts, we know that at this point in the story, this guy named Paul, right, who was named Saul, changes his name to be more uh, uh, relevant to his Greek audience. He's had this dramatic conversion experience. He's now journeying around the Middle East, around modern day Turkey, into Europe, proclaiming the gospel, the good news about Jesus. This is one of my favorite scenes, one of my favorite stories in all of scripture because it has so much to say to us about how we share the gospel, how we participate in the good news here in our particular context in Davis, California. So we begin in verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. Them is Silas and Timothy, two of Paul's partners. He's waiting for them to join him here. And Paul never wanted to waste a moment. So he, he's looking around, taking a walk, traveling around the city of Athens, and he is overwhelmed at this city that is full of idols. Now, time out. I want to pause here for just a moment. We are going to watch here over the next several verses. We're going to watch Paul engage in what we might call cultural exegesis. Now, exegesis, one of those fancy theological words uh, that we're like, what does that even mean? But what it means is this. It's usually a word that's used to talk about interpreting Scripture, and that's what exegesis means, to, to read from, right? To, to take a look at it, break it down, understand what's going on in a particular text. So cultural exegesis, then, is interpreting not a text, but the culture. Paul's a master of this. And we do well to follow his example because we need to be interpreters, exegetes of Scripture, absolutely, but we also need to be great interpreters, exegetes of our culture. One of the best uh, sort of apologetics for this comes from the great John Stott who wrote a book called Between Two Worlds where he makes the case we need to interpret Scripture and we need to interpret our world, our context, and then our job is to build a bridge between those two things so that people can understand who God is and what He is doing in their midst. Now in that spirit, <clears throat> if Paul were to walk around Davis, do you think he would be distressed by the idols here. Now we, you know, our city is set up differently than, than Athens. We're in a moment going to see Paul go to this place called the Oropagus where they had all of these idols set up. We may not have things that are quite that visible, but there are absolutely idols that have power, that have influence in our city here in Davis. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. The idol of achievement. My daughter is in third grade this year, and third grade is when the, the Davis school district begins to assess kids for the, the GATE program, right? The gifted and talented uh, uh, educational program here uh, in our school district. And it's really interesting on, on uh, the opening uh, back to school night, all these third grade parents are like, what are you going to do you know, to the teachers? What are you going to do to prepare my kid for for this thing like it's a test that you prepare for or something it's really not it's just an assessment of where kids are but already in third grade that pressure of i got to get into this program got to achieve got to do more right the idol of achievement what about what about the idol of self sufficiency Amy and I, over the last year and a half, we, you know, we've reached out to many people. And this is not really a discovery thing, but we've reached out to other people in our life. You know, COVID's hard. Things are, things are tough. How can we help you? And I can't tell you how many times we got, oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. We don't need your help. And, and maybe, maybe people were just being honest and didn't really need our help. But there's that, like, I, I can do this. I don't need other people. We're good on our own. What about the idol of busyness? When was the last time you asked someone, you know, how's it going? You know, and someone was like, oh man, I just am like so not busy. I have nothing to do. I have all this open time. Like if somebody really said that, we'd all probably be like, what's wrong with that guy? <laughs> because it's so normal for us to say, oh, I'm so busy. Life's crazy right now. All that kind of stuff, right? Achievement, self-sufficiency, busyness. I'm sure we could come up with an even longer list. But here's where I really want to go with this. There's two important questions here. Number one. Do you see it? 
Are we able to interpret the culture? Can we name the idols? Are we able to take that step back, look at what's going on around us and go, that's an idol. That's an idol. Achievement, busyness, self-sufficiency. So first question is, can we see it, right? Can we name those idols? And then the second question is, is it distressing? We may be able to name them, we may be able to see it, but does it break our heart? Do we go, oh, I can't, that, ah. Oh. Why is that? And I could probably point to, to many of them, but the one that really gets me is the community versus self-sufficiency, right? That, like, I don't need anybody else. Somebody reached out to me this last week to say, hey, I've, I've got it into a tough place financially. Um, can you help? And one of the things I was reflecting on in that is just how rare that happens, especially here in Davis, that somebody would be, uh, vulnerable enough to say, I need help, particularly in this way, because so much of our self-sufficiency is tied to our finances, right? I thought that was actually really powerful, again, and vulnerable ask to say, I need help with this. Does it break our hearts? Is it distressing? Paul goes on. Here, here we go. Verse 17. He reasoned then in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. So Paul walks around the city of Athens. He's distressed by the idols. He sees what's going on and then he begins to talk with people and he does what he often does. We've seen this pattern before, right? He starts with the the Jews in the synagogue, but then he moves to God-fearing Greeks, to whoever shows up in the marketplace. And then in verse 18, to a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who begin to debate with him and, and, and they ask him like, what are you talking about? They actually call him the babbler. Like, what is this babbler? trying to say. Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Now, the Epicureans were disciples of the Greek philosopher Epicurus. They were basically hedonists. Life is all about enjoyment and pleasure, so live life to the full, literally fraternity bros of the actual Greek world. (laughs) And then the Stoics are almost the opposite of that. They believed emotion clouded judgment and made it difficult for people to reason well and act virtuously. So this is a very interesting crowd. Jews, God-fearing Greeks, random people that showed up in the marketplace, uh, two different philosophical groups on very uh, different ends of the spectrum. Paul interacting with all these different worldviews and into that mix, right? His uh, multicultural skill into that mix, where does he take the conversation? He takes it to Jesus and the resurrection. Now look at what happens next, verse 20. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears. We would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Nice little bit of shade there from Luke. But this should ring some bells. This is kind of what happened last week, right? Again, in that scene where this young man approaches Jesus and says very directly, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to live a good life, to live in the reality of the kingdom? And in the same way, Paul, what are you talking about? This Jesus and the resurrection. Tell us more. These sort of uh, golden opportunities to share the gospel with people. Now, those of us with church background who have been trained in the traditional American Gospels, and we named four of them the last couple of weeks if you need to go back uh, for that context. But what do we typically do here? We start, you know, drawing charts and graphs and diagrams and talking about four spiritual laws and, hey, pray, follow me, pray this prayer. But what does Paul do? What does Paul do next? He stands up in the meeting of the Oropagus and he says, People of Athens... I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and I looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Paul starts with what they know. He affirms their deeply religious impulse. He makes a connection between this particular idol they had, right, to the unknown God and what he's about to say. I'm going to explain to you what this unknown God 
is all about. Quick side note here, we start a lot of our teachings with a pop culture reference or some sort of, uh, of everyday experience, not because we're trying to be hip or cute. We're, we're using Paul's gospeling example here, right? He starts where they are. He starts where they are. He affirms their religious impulse. He uses their artifacts, and then he begins to move towards the story of Jesus. Now, here's how he tells the story. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else for From one man he made all nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times and history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So what does Paul do? He goes into the big story. The God who created everything. The God who sustains us and desires relationship with us. And then he ends, not with a Bible verse and a prayer, but with two quotes from their own poets and philosophers. He ends with Radiohead and Amanda Gorman, right? Cultural exegesis. In our gospeling, in our sharing of the good news, we have to know the culture. We have to know the connecting points between the big story between the good news of Jesus and the people we are with. Now, here's how he lands this thing. Verse 29, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So here, Paul begins to turn it back on them. This is not just an interesting idea to debate and discuss. This is a reality that has deeply personal implications. This reality called resurrection. When they heard... About the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want, to hear, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council, and some people became followers and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Oropagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. In a pluralistic society like ours, this varied response is actually quite encouraging, right? We should expect to get some sneers but also some who are willing to hear more, right? We want to hear you again on this subject. And then some who believe. Now, while Paul is quite skilled at cultural exegesis, quite skilled at multicultural bridge building, at the heart of the conversation is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You can use all the cultural touch points you want, but at the end of the day, the whole thing, everything we are about, rises and falls on Jesus' resurrection. Now, in the very next chapter, Paul goes to a city called Corinth to help get the church established there. Later on, he writes multiple letters to this church. At the end of the first letter, he says this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel, the good news that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I passed on or for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. So this is huge, right? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Then he also appeared to James and to the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. And that's just a reference to how Paul was converted in this dramatic fashion back in Acts chapter 9. Now he goes on, verse 16, to say this, If the dead are not raised, 
then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We end this conversation, what we talk about when we talk about the gospel, we end with the resurrection because it's so central to Paul's conversation with the philosophers in Athens, this pluralistic, multicultural context, very similar to ours, but we also end with the resurrection because it is the foundation of the good news about Jesus. As Paul makes so clear in this this letter to Corinth, the American Gospels tend to focus on sin as the main problem of the story. And, And there's kind of an interesting tangent here around the question, you know, is our problem sin or is it death? And the answer, of course, is both, right? The wages of sin is death. But remember, remember, as we've said each week, Jesus says, God so loved the world, not God so hated sin. The focus on sin leads to starting the story in Genesis 3 with the fall and and, and how terrible we are, and then ending the story on Good Friday at the cross, the story of fall, redemption, sin, forgiveness. You blew it, Jesus fixes it. This is not a bad story. And it's absolutely a part of the bigger story, but it's not the whole story. The whole story, right, as Paul shows us in Acts 17, it begins with creation. With the goodness, the shalom of creation. Shalom violated by our sin, yes. And the fallout of that is massive. Broken relationships and death. Broken relationships and death. That's the problem. And yeah, the cross is a huge part of this. Absolutely healing, redeeming, and justifying. But it's the power of the resurrection that changes everything, that inaugurates Jesus as king, that opens the kingdom up to everybody. It's the power of the resurrection that overcomes death, that gives us hope and changes everything right here and right now and into eternity. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Are you with me? It's the resurrection that interrupts the normal ways of the world and introduces something new and radical. It's what we all deep in our souls long for, transformation, new life, abundance, the old gone, the new has come, the good news of Jesus. The gospel is big. It's wide and deep and high and long and there is no end of exploring its richness and implications. It's not just an idea to agree with. It's a reality to participate in. It's an adventure to embark on. It's a journey to undertake. It's a gift to be received. It's a treasure to be shared. It's a light to be shown. We, to quote Eugene Peterson, practice the resurrection. We practice the resurrection when we love and serve and give ourselves away when we share our stories and bear one another's burdens, when we open our homes and our tables, we practice resurrection. When we confess and repent, we practice the resurrection. When we ask good questions and listen well, when we set up the theater and gather on Sunday mornings, when we get together in groups, in homes to allow the scripture to shape us, when we plant gardens and write letters to prisoners and make meals for new parents, we practice the resurrection, when we share and demonstrate the good news of Jesus, we practice the resurrection. It's an adventure. This kingdom of God life. Are you in? Are you in? Now as we get ready to take communion and sing a final song, Together, we also practice the resurrection when we share this meal. This meal that reminds us of the story. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. What Jesus has done on our behalf. The gift that we can receive because of who he is and what he has done. 
that he gave his life for us on that cross, but also that he did not stay dead. Three days later, comes out of the tomb, raised to life, resurrected, so that we might have relationship with God, abundant life here and now and into eternity. When you're ready, take communion with us.
this morning and for continuing to follow along with our conversation as a community. Let's go out with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Grace and peace, friends.